Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar broadcast. Today, we'll be spending the next 45 minutes or so talking about riparian ecology and function. This is the first of our week's webinars. If you're not familiar with the GoToWebinar software, it allows you to participate in a few ways. First, through live polls, and we will be doing a few of these throughout the broadcast. Secondly, through the Ask Questions window. If you see the little hand icon to your right and then click it, this allows you to ask questions by typing them in the question space provided. We could see your questions and we will respond at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session for those questions that we have time for. And if you have any technical difficulties at the, in the presentation, we could provide you with the GoToWebinar helpline. So just for a quick technology check-in, please raise your hand if you could hear me and see the screen. And we're just doing a check on all your end to see if everybody has raised their hand. Okay. Good, thank you very much. And if you can also let me know in the question box where you are participating from today. Thanks. We are the Alberta Riparian Habitat Management Society, better known as Cows and Fish. We are a nonprofit organization and registered charity operating in Alberta. Myself and our 15 other staff strive to foster a better understanding of riparian areas for the benefit of those who use and value them, including agricultural producers, as the name cows and fish might suggest, and other users like urban, municipal, rural and acreage, cottage or lakeshore users, and their communities. Our approach is voluntary in nature and stems from the three pillars of environmental stewardship, building awareness, development of an ethic, and the resulting action. To learn more about how and who we work with, I invite you to visit our website or connect with us on social media. So just to quickly introduce ourselves today, with me today is Carrie O'Shaughnessy, the riparian specialist in our Edmonton office, and she's operating the technical end of this webinar. And myself, Carolyn Ross, I am presenting the information that we compiled today, and I am based out of our Red Deer location. So we come to our first poll here, and I would, Questions and answers are going to pop up on your screen here, but I would like you to rate your understanding of the riparian ecology and function prior to this webinar. And I'll ask that you remember your answer as there will be a follow-up question in the evaluation after the webinar. So we're just waiting for some of those responses to come in. Okay, so as you could see on your screens, we have a good range of um, background base knowledge on riparian areas. So we have a couple of flagship publications in Cows and Fish, the um, Riparian Areas and Grazing Management booklet, as well as the Riparian Areas a User's Guide to Health. You could see those pictured up on your screen. A lot of the material from today is from these publications, and you could find them online, where you'll also find numerous other fact sheets. These are, are available digitally, or you could request them to be mailed out to you. A common question we get from landowners is, we don't have cows, or we don't have fish. Does cows and fish still want to work with us? And yes, we at Riparian, Alberta Riparian Habitat Management Society work with all types of landowners and land managers. The core of our mission is to improve riparian understanding and management, whether you are a rancher with cows, a lake village resident, 
or an urban dweller. We at Cows and Fish like to think of ourselves as a conduit for knowledge between landowners and land managers and the scientific researchers. When working together, these two groups of people can have a profound impact on the landscape, blending natural wisdom with scientific knowledge to enable landscape change. So what is riparian? Riparian areas are those lands adjacent to streams, rivers, lakes, and wetlands. It is that zone between the dry uplands and the water. There are two types of riparian areas, flowing water or lotic sites, and still water, which we call lentic. These areas have unique characteristics and ecological functions, which we will discuss as the webinar progresses. Riparian areas and their impacts have been in the news for the last few years. Perhaps it's the recent floods and droughts bringing watershed management to people's attention. Governments across the prairies are implementing policy and management changes. Agricultural producers and cities are dealing with the effects of floods and drought and everyday citizens are volunteering to gather data for wetland science. Riparian areas are important to many facets of life. In general, we care about riparian areas because of their benefits to agriculture, industry, tourism, and recreation, as well as to their benefits for biodiversity and water quality. A healthy functioning riparian area offers resiliency to environmental stresses like drought or floods and provides numerous ecological services and stability to the system. Historically, wetlands have been perceived as nuisances, especially the seasonal wetlands and streams. Wetland loss in the Canadian prairies has been estimated between 40 and up to 90 percent in some areas. Wetlands are often viewed as an impediment in the path of our roads, fields, and cities. In the 1900s, wetlands and rivers were essential to the residents and the newly founded towns in the prairies. Settlements and industry depended on rivers for transportation, as well as a source of drinking water, fish, and for agricultural production. We could use early photographs to provide an indication of the riparian areas in the past, as well as for accounts of drought and floods. A photographic record of a riparian area is a useful tool. Some of the changes on the landscape occur beyond an individual's memory, or the changes are too small and minute to notice at the time. Because of this, we sometimes fail to notice that change or even deterioration has happened. Riparian areas don't exist in isolation. They are connected to the larger watershed. In Alberta, we have seven major river basins or watersheds, starting in the north, the Hay, the Peace Slave, Athabasca, Beaver, North Saskatchewan, South Saskatchewan, and along the south border, the Milk River. There are also four additional sub watersheds, the Bow, Old Man, and Red Deer Rivers, which flow into the South Saskatchewan, and the Battle River, which flows into the North Saskatchewan. So you may be asking yourself, what is a watershed? It is an area of land that captures snow and water. It is also called a catchment or basin. Geography separates different watersheds. Eventually, all the water collected by the watershed either ends up being absorbed by the soils or transported by its creeks and rivers into the lakes and seas. In Alberta, there are several major rivers that start from the glaciers and Banff and Jasper National Parks. Snowmelt is the largest contributor to the annual flows in these rivers, followed by rainfall. There are also several smaller watersheds that are not glacial fed and rely solely on snow, rainfall, and the water captured in the soils to maintain their flows. Alberta's rivers eventually drain into three major ocean bodies, the Arctic Ocean via the Mackenzie River, the Hudson's Bay via the Churchill and Nelson Rivers, and the Gulf of Mexico via the Missouri River. So getting back to riparian areas, 
These are the green zones around the lakes and wetlands, the emerald threads of vegetation that border rivers and streams. You may call it, or may have heard it called, a floodplain, shoreline, bottomland, or stream bank. Riparian areas are found both on non-flowing water bodies, or lentic sites, and flowing water systems, or lotic sites. They are the transition zones between the open water, aquatic zone, and the uplands. Riparian areas on lakes and wetlands extends into that emergent zone where the vegetation like cattails and rushes grow. This is a photo of Michichi Creek in Starland County in South Central Alberta. In this photo, the riparian area and width is easily, easily identified. The uplands have yet to green up compared to the riparian area, which greens up earlier. There is a wide variety of riparian diversity within Alberta, both geographically across the different ecoregions of prairie, parkland, boreal, and foothills, and also in the type of riparian area, from large rivers and streams, lakes and wetlands, and temporary or ephemeral wetlands and streams. As we move further north in the province into the boreal, the riparian boundary is often difficult to determine by just visual observations. As in this image, most of the landscape is green. You could think of the riparian area as wetter than dry, but drier than wet. In the central and northern parts of the province, the riparian area may require a more in-depth observation of vegetation and soil type. Determining the border, edge, and size of a riparian area can be made even more difficult where land use has modified some of the clues. Whether groundwater or surface water influenced, riparian areas tend to be more green, more lush, and more productive than the adjacent uplands. It is their close connection to the water table that increases their productivity. Riparian areas occupy as little as 2 and up to 5% of the settled portion of Alberta, essentially the white zone. It's a very small portion. However, they tend to be some of the more productive areas in our landscape. Their importance and significance is far larger than their small size would indicate. And here we are to our second poll of the day. The question here is, do you have riparian areas on lands that you own, rent, lease, or manage? So if you could please answer that. Okay, I think we've got everybody in. No. Nope. All right, well, it looks like the majority of us do have riparian areas on our land. Thank you for replying. So moving on, riparian areas are all about the interaction of plants, water, and soil. Although riparian areas are extremely dynamic and rarely uniform, the common factor defining all riparian areas is this interaction between the water, soil, and vegetation. There are three characteristics that help define riparian areas. First, water is present either seasonally or regularly and is either at the surface or near the surface. Secondly, vegetation is present that responds to, requires, or survives in abundant water conditions. And lastly, the soils have been modified by water, stream and lake processes, and by the productive vegetation. It is this interaction between the soils, water, and vegetation that make riparian areas unique, as well as very sensitive and important in the terms of the role that they play in our landscape. The functions that happen in riparian areas are related to water quality, water quantity and supply, and primary productivity and biodiversity. 
things are important, not only to fish and wildlife, but also to humans. The eight main functions that riparian areas perform include trapping and storing sediment, building and maintaining banks and shores, storing water and energy, recharging aquifers, filtering and buffering water, reducing and dissipating energy, creating primary productivity, and maintaining biodiversity. In this slide, there are a variety of lakes. There is a lake that has an outlet, a lake that has an intermittent outlet, and a lake that has no outlet. This can all change seasonally from year to year. One of the simplest ways of thinking about lakes is that this is about water that doesn't flow. Or thinking about it a different way, it's about water that flows very slowly. Now compared to streams that move right along, it's said that you can't put your foot in the same stream twice. You could probably do that with a lake. Lakes and wetlands are places that water accumulates. There are a few words specific to lakes, so let's quickly review them. You've likely heard the words like oligotrophic and eutrophic. The root of both words is troph, which means nourishment. So these words are about the productivity level of the lake. Oligotrophic lakes have little nutrients. Generally, these are the deep, cold lakes, usually in the headwaters area. Eutrophic lakes have lots of nutrients. These are lakes sometimes at the tail end of the system, often called terminal basins. There's often no outlet and things accumulate in them. And in the middle are the mesotrophic lakes. These lakes can be called middle-aged. This is a photo of an oligotrophic lake found in the headwater system, right at the very head of a watershed in the mountains. And this is one of those middle-aged lakes, the mesotrophic lake. They are balancing on a cusp. They get a little more nutrients, but not enough to take them into the eutrophic category. Eutrophic lakes are lakes that are aging. All lakes naturally age. When they start to infill, vegetation begins to establish in the infill material. Nutrients that have been flowing through the watershed are now in the sink. These lakes produce a lot of vegetation. They could produce a lot of algae as well, and also can be very productive fishery lakes. We are on a continuum here. Left to their own devices, over a geologic time frame, a lot of lakes will become eutrophic. They will infill, vegetation will establish in the sediment, and they will start to close over and resemble fens and bogs, and soon dry land. Wetlands and lakes are sinks, bathtubs, or basins. Things flow into them. Sediment from the watershed flows into tributary streams and into lakes and is deposited there. Along with sediments, all the nutrients, phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium, bind to the sediment particles. These sediment particles are the transportation medium that gets the nutrients into the lake where they accumulate. Because of the turnover rate, the volume of water in the lake turns over very slowly, maybe once every 100 or 200 years. So these nutrients tend to st stay in the lake. Lakes and wetlands go through cycles. Water levels go up and down based on climate. Sometimes the water level rises and floods the riparian vegetation or the shoreline area for a matter of a few weeks particularly if there has been a big runoff event. If that precipitation level persists over a number of years, the water levels will stay up long enough that the vegetation that typically likes to keep its feet wet only a few days of a year now has its feet wet all year and it subsequently dies out. Streams and rivers and their tributaries are their flowing connections to the lakes and wetlands in the watershed. Streams and rivers have three common elements. The water in the channel has mass or weight. The mass of the water is being pulled downhill under the influence of gravity. And the water flows at some speed or velocity. The stream's engine 
is the mass of water moving downhill, and how much horsepower the stream's engine has depends on the slope, the amount of flow, and the resistance along the bank and channel. The work of the stream is to erode material from its banks and bed, and then transport that material downstream. Streams erode the outside of the meander bend and deposit material downstream on the inside of the meander bend. Eroded material is transported downstream either as suspended sediments in water or by rolling on the stream bottom. When the stream's engine races, say during spring snowmelt, the horsepower is unleashed, allowing the stream to work harder at eroding and transporting. Doubling the speed of a stream's flow allows it to erode four times as much and carry 64 times the amount of material. Stream and river channels are seldom straight. In an effort to balance the water speed, valley slope, and the amount of sediment that can be transported, streams naturally meander or curve. Shorelines are also impacted by water in motion. Wind and ice action create the potential for erosion of our shorelines. The greater the wind, the greater the wave height, length, and velocity, thus increasing the potential for erosion. Streams with healthy riparian areas that are well vegetated with meanders will chug along and maintain their function and values. In contrast, streams respond to straightening and vegetation removal by racing, and the chain reaction can reduce the productive nature of the riparian areas. Historically, riparian areas in the province look much different than they look today. Here is the Sturgeon River, north of Edmonton, in the 1920s and again in the 1990s. Notice the difference in the amount of vegetation in the valley. Some channelization has occurred, especially in the top right corner of the 1990s picture when the road was constructed. And there has been much development in the riparian areas. How we face the issues surrounding riparian areas and their management will influence their future use, productivity, and health. We know we face real issues based on the summary of riparian health for Alberta from the on-the-ground riparian health inventory and assessment data collected by cows and fish. This data has been collected from a variety of land uses, agricultural, lakefront, urban, acreages, and private and public lands. Measurements of riparian health help us understand the proportion of reaches where all ecological functions are being performed, shown in the green hatch area in the healthy category, those with stress and some impairment, the healthy but with problems category shown in yellow, and the ones that are severely damaged or unhealthy shown in red. As you see, slightly over one quarter of the riparian areas we have assessed have a healthy status. About one half are healthy with problems and just under one quarter are unhealthy. The provincial average score of 70% is based on 2,678 sites that we have assessed on 673 water bodies between the years of 1997 and 2016. Riparian areas change naturally over time. What we do in them and in the watersheds that surround them can speed up many of these changes. Sometimes the speed and degree of change is greater than the natural resiliency and healing rate of the riparian area. Development can cause streams to erode their banks faster, flows may fluctuate more, and dry up production of riparian areas. By looking at how these uses impact riparian areas and their function, we could better utilize management tools to improve riparian health. 
When we look at a piece of a riparian landscape, we often focus on what it does for us. We think about the opportunities to fish, to recreate, to graze livestock, or find shelter and shade. As we begin to understand more about riparian areas, we could add to that list things like water quality, water quantity, fish and wildlife habitat, to the list of riparian products, services, and values. The products, services, and benefits of these riparian areas are significant compared to their small size. When in a healthy condition, riparian areas provide us with a suite of ecological services, such as filtering and buffering water, storing water, creating soil, and growing vegetation and habitats. These are all things that the environment could do for us free of charge when the landscape is in good condition. Riparian areas are too productive, too important, and too valuable to go unrecognized and unmanaged. And an understanding of how riparian areas are formed and how they function is the first step to understanding how to manage them. Vegetation is the key to riparian management. We can't often change the topography or slope of the landscape, nor how much precipitation falls, but we can have significant impacts on the types, abundance, and diversity of vegetation in our riparian systems. Riparian vegetation, such as the willows shown here, dogwood, aspen and poplar, sedges, rushes, and cattails are all important riparian species. These riparian species do three things to influence riparian health and function. The first is to provide deep root binding root mass. The root of the solution for riparian management begins with vegetation. By Providing reinforcement, the deep woody vegetation acts like rebar, holding our stream banks and shorelines together. Woody species with deep binding roots include poplars, aspen, birch and conifers, and shrubs, willows, saskatoon, silverberry, and chokecherry. There are also some deep wooded, deep rooted non-woody plants like sedges, cattails and bulrushes that play a key part in the deep binding root mass. The second role of riparian vegetation is to slow down water or provide resistance against flow. The less velocity, the less work the water can do. And lastly, vegetation traps sediment to build new stream banks and shores. Plants not only bind soil in place, but they also trap moving sediment. When sediment is captured and used to build new banks, that's what we call good mud. Banks and shores resistant to water horsepower form the foundation of a stable riparian area. Stream bank stability is linked to vegetation cover, its health, diversity, and abundance. Mixing continuous use and the lack of preferred vegetation leads to a crumbling of the foundation. For low gradient streams, deep rooted sedges may be enough to glue together stream banks, trap sediment, and resist water flow. For larger, higher gradient streams and rivers, shrubs and tree species are needed to stabilize stream banks. The same can be said for lakes and wetlands. The larger the water body, the greater the wave action, and the larger the plant materials and roots needed to bind the shores. So if the previous was good mud, what kind of mud is, this kind of mud is bad mud. Where the vegetation is lacking, less sediment is captured, resulting in a lower capability for water absorption and storage, in addition to reduced water quality. We talked earlier about the ecological goods and services provided by riparian areas. One of the most important services they provide is to filter and buffer water, providing good water quality. It doesn't matter who you are, water quality is important to you. 
Water on the floodplain has the opportunity to pick up not only sediment, but also nutrients and contaminants from a variety of sources. Riparian vegetation, such as cattails, oh, sorry, here we go. Riparian vegetation, such as cattails, trap, grab, suck up, and take in nutrients and contaminants that can be found in the runoff and floodwaters. Vegetation acts like a natural water filter, improving water quality. This translates into reduced water treatment costs, good aquatic habitat for fish and wildlife, safer water for those who use it, and healthier livestock. The effectiveness of riparian areas to improve water quality varies because of the different soil types, slopes, and how water moves underground, as well as climate. In general, healthy, well-vegetated riparian areas will be more effective than less healthy, poorly vegetated riparian areas. They will be good at removing sediments, microbes, nutrients, and pesticides attached to those sediments. In addition to water quality, riparian areas impact water quantity. Healthy flood floodplains, which are well vegetated, the portion of the image on the left of the screen, slow the flow of water, allowing it to spread and soak in effectively. In contrast, water speeds over floodplains with poor vegetation, the half of the image on the right of the screen, and it does not linger long enough to fill the underground sponge. Flooding can be viewed as one way to put water in the bank, both figuratively and literally. Water saturates the floodplain and raises the water table. For most streams, flow in the late summer, fall, and winter months depends on the groundwater storage, a withdrawal of the spring investment. In healthy, well-managed watersheds, the stored groundwater is released back into the stream and riparian area. Again, the image on your left. Watersheds with poor groundwater storage capability may suffer low stream bank flows as the limited storage is exhausted. If you don't plan wisely for your water investments, the risks can be high and the return poor. Healthy riparian areas with groundwater storage capability help to buffer the impacts of both floods and droughts. Riparian areas trap and store water year round. Having more water on the landscape helps to keep water available for livestock, fish, wildlife, humans, and to maintain riparian plant communities. Riparian areas are a magnet for livestock and wildlife. They provide shelter, water, and succulent vegetation. The attraction of riparian areas increases as the uplands become drier throughout the summer. If you're interested in learning more about riparian areas and wildlife, our webinar tomorrow looks into that topic. Beavers are a key species in wetlands and riparian areas. I encourage you to take part in one of our beaver presentations to learn all about these wetland engineers. And there is also one of our webinars this week that deals with beavers. Some species may not be quite so happy that riparian areas attract so many animals, especially if the newcomers are above them on the food chain. Riparian areas are hotbeds of biodiversity. As mentioned, 80% of all of Alberta's wildlife and 100% of the fish find homes in riparian areas. Species use riparian areas for food, nesting habitat, shelter, travel corridors, connectors between different habitats, and for stopovers on migration routes. Fish are indicators of the degree of health of a water body. This image represents a walleye catch from only two hours of fishing in 1894. 124 years ago, 
the fishery was quite different from what we experience today. This bull trout is one of Alberta's threatened species. Trout are sensitive to water quality and water chemistry and have low tolerances for changes in water temperature, dissolved oxygen, and physical habitat. A healthy, well-vegetated riparian area contributes to the water quality conditions favored by trout. Riparian vegetation shades the stream, reducing water temperatures. It also traps sediment, reducing water turbidity, and improves the water chemistry values. A change in fish populations can be indicative of dramatic changes in habitat quality. If trout are replaced by northern pike populations, for example, it suggests that the ecosystem can't support these sensitive trout species. It may be difficult to restore fish habitat in some systems until we take a watershed approach to resolving issues around riparian health, water quality, and water quantity. An example of the watershed approach is this study on the fishery of the North Raven River, which shows the importance of riparian areas to fish populations. When riparian areas on the North Raven River were protected and managed over a period of 20 years, trout populations responded to the increase in habitat opportunities. In comparison, reaches of the stream that were not managed show substantial declines in fish populations. Biodiversity benefits not just plants and wildlife, but it also benefits us. An area with high biodiversity is generally more resilient to the impact of pests, disease, drought, and flooding. Riparian areas provide a value to us. They are not just pretty landscapes to look at. Ecological goods and services that have a real value for our society, for our ranches, for our sustainability on the landscape. Riparian areas are also key producers of primary productivity and forage. In a study on forage production, healthy riparian areas outperformed degraded air riparian areas. Primary productivity doesn't just translate into forage for livestock and wildlife, but also into shade, shelter, moderating stream temperatures, trapping carbon, providing a large woody debris supply, and timber and habitat connectivity. Our management impacts this productivity and can limit the benefits. There are always choices to be made. And here we come to our last poll. Please choose which riparian function you think is most important and you could choose more than one function. So I'll just give people some time here to fill that in. Yeah, so if um, we've got about 85% of respondent attendees responding in here, if, um, oh, now we're greater than 90%, so that's great. Um, thank you very much for answering that. And just to recap, the key concepts of riparian function. When healthy, riparian areas can provide a whole host of benefits for us, including cleaner water, more water in the system, higher biodiversity and resiliency, as well as higher agricultural production. And how do you know if an area is riparian? The three characteristics are that water is present either year round or at some part of the year, perhaps just springtime, that the vegetation species are adapted to the fluctuating water table conditions, and the soil characteristics have been modified by the presence of water, the stream and lake processes, and the 
productive vegetation. Riparian areas can look quite different from each other and can look different from year to year or season to season. Changes to water levels, water supply, and surrounding land use can impact how, how a riparian area looks over time. And how does a riparian area function? Listed here are the eight main functions of the riparian areas. And if the right choices are made, we will continue to benefit from the many things that riparian areas do for us, like filtering water, producing primary productivity, storing water on the landscape, and maintaining biodiversity. And how do we benefit from riparian areas? When healthy, riparian areas can provide for a whole host of benefits for us. This diagram has an extensive list of riparian area benefits and it is found in our publications. For example, cleaner water results in human, lower human illness, reduced water treatment costs, healthier livestock, higher livestock weight gains, and fish populations or perhaps the buffering capacity of the riparian areas can decrease the risk, costs, and incidence of floods and erosion. They can allow for more rapid recovery from disturbances or increased resiliency and ensure more stable production of other goods and services. You could join us in the webinar on February 8th, which follows up this talk on riparian ecology and function with a look at riparian health. You will learn to tune your eyes to the key characteristics of ecological function that we discussed today and understand our riparian health assessments. Our goal at Cows and Fish is to educate, engage, and help make management changes that improve riparian health. Watch our website for future webinars, workshops, and field days throughout the year. We encourage you to follow us in our exploration of all things riparian. And here is just a list of some of our up and coming events for the next couple months. Um, the webinar week tomorrow is the Wildlife and Riparian Zones talk. February 7th is Beavers in Our Landscape. February 8th is the Riparian Health. And February 9th is a Grazing 101 talk. We have a couple of workshops. Beavers in our landscape will be presented in Athabasca and in Drayton Valley this spring. And we also have a Google Earth and grazing workshop held in March. And just a reminder that after this webinar, you'll receive a link to fill out an evaluation. And we'd appreciate it if you took the time to provide some feedback on this webinar. So we have time for a few questions here, and I think Carrie is going to read us out some of the questions. Oh, if anyone has any questions, please um, type them in the question box for us. We have a lot of materials available on our website, um, fact sheets, as well as the two main booklets that I showed at the beginning of the talk. So you're welcome to check out the materials online there. So I guess there aren't any questions coming in. Um, oh, we might have something here. Okay, we have a question. It is, how do riparian areas filter out sediment? Um, basically, the vegetation in the riparian area is going to trap and prevent a lot of that sediment that's running off the um, uplands, either through rain events or floods. And it's going to just block that sediment from reaching the water body by a physical um, trap of the sediment. I hope that answers your question. Um, and 
Oh, we have a few more coming in here. Can we print and distribute some of your publications? Um, the publications are available digitally, so you are able to print them out. And yes, you may distribute them. And the next question is, how large of a buffer is needed to trap sediment? That depends a bit on the landscape and topography and land use that is surrounding the riparian area. Um, it varies from, um, from situation to situation. Um, basically, a larger buffer is going to be better than a smaller one, and um, that's, that's all I could say at this point without a specific. Um, will this webinar recording be available after the presentation is another question, and I believe the answer to that is yes. You can um, Okay, so yeah, I was just told that the recording will come up after the webinar is over and you can access it then. This, uh, this is Carrie O'Shaughnessy just popping in. I'm reading uh, some of your questions here and there's uh, some good ones coming in now at rapid fire. Um, let me see what else I can find here. People have a lot of uh, questions about, you know, buildup of, of pesticides or nutrients um, in the riparian area and sort of how that affects the vegetation. Um, one of the things to think about is, you know, riparian areas tend to be that sink and, uh, you know, because they're at the bottom of the hill and they collect, uh, you know, nutrients and sediments and things like that. So um, they, they can uh, build up uh, there if the um, load that's coming in is, is greater than uh, what the plants can hold up or can use up. Um, there's one uh, question here about uh, legislation. Uh, that's a great question. Um, we're not the regulators of uh, riparian areas in Alberta. Obviously, we're an extension group, but um, things like uh, the Water Act and the um, and, um, Public Lands Act, uh, those those two um, pop into mind uh, for sure. That uh, that would take into account riparian areas as uh, as well as um, you know some of the other uh, types of acts related to um, you know water water quality and uh, some of the land use and nutrient management as well. Just uh, still reading, they're coming in quick. We won't be able to uh, to answer all these just uh, just because some of them um, I think would require a bit more of a detailed answer. So we will try and get back to uh, to all the questions um, even post webinar, and uh, and make sure that we have at least some sort of a response for you. And definitely the, all the questions about uh, about the pesticides. Um, I think those are are best answered um, post webinar. So hang on for those. They need a little more thought. Right. Okay. So we will follow up with some of those answers post webinar. And just to finish off here, we have uh, some acknowledgement for the imagery in the presentation as well. We'd like to thank our supporters for the funding to produce these webinars. And lastly is just our contact information for both myself and Carrie in Edmonton. If you're looking to contact a specialist in your own area of the province, please check our website. It lists um, 
our other staff members throughout the province. So I just want to thank you again for participating and I hope that you join us for some of our other webinars this week.